Hello and welcome. We have with us today Professor Samir Amin, one of the world's leading Marxist thinkers. Uh, he is associated himself with two major forums, the Third World uh, Forum and the World Forum for uh, Alternatives. I'll first uh, like to ask Samir, you to tell us a little bit about these two forums that you have been leading and uh, structuring. And after that, we'll go on and discuss the situation as it has developed in the Arab world uh, in this year of uprisings and turbulence and uh, reactionary uh, restorations and so on. So tell us a little bit about the two forums that I just mentioned, the Third World Forum and the World Forum for Alternatives. Well, good afternoon, Ijaz, and good afternoon, and thank you for this interview. Well, Third World Forum was created in the 70s of past century as an independent uh, association with the <clears throat> as an independent network of thinkers uh, from Asia, Africa, plus Cuba, from the non-aligned countries. Uh, we, we had felt, some of us, at that point in time, that non-alignment needed also to be supported by an independent uh, organization of thinkers uh, of, the, uh, of the left, uh, Lato Sensu. And we established a Third World Forum as such. Uh, we have been given a diplomatic status within the non-aligned... Uh, in Senegal. In Senegal, within the non-aligned uh, uh, movement. And um, that is <clears throat> an independent, I'm stressing, which means independent from the governments uh, of the non-aligned uh, uh, group and from the major uh, parties which were also component of non-alignment. Uh, but, uh, but in order to support and to reinforce the uh, uh, non-alignment vis-à-vis the imperialist uh, uh, coming aggression, which uh, we felt w w was going to come. And then late, and we, we have survived at such uh, since then, which means uh, uh, three decades and more, uh, four decades now. But uh, then uh, towards the end of the century, exactly in 1997, we felt the need to enlarge and reinforce uh, that network by associating more closely, on the one hand, Latin America, and on the other hand, also friends in the North, in Europe and North America and Japan. And that is wh when we created together uh, with uh, a number of uh, uh, think tanks, uh, um, the World Forum for Alternatives in Cairo in 1997. Uh, we, we were ahead of time since, uh, as you know, the World Social Forum. That's right. Yes. That's right. yes. First, uh, first assembly was met only in, in 2001 in Porto Alegre in Brazil. But we organized the first, uh, uh, it was a media event, it was not a major event, uh, a first event in Davos in one in 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 ninety nine, which was the anti Davos in Davos. When I first heard of the World Social Forum, the very first thing that came to my mind at that time was, in fact, the names of the two uh, forums you you were already uh, running, and even the similarity of the name. Yeah, and so on. Yeah. Let me ask you a very broad question about uh, uh, the Arab situation uh, at the moment. Um, one of the tendencies uh, that I think all of us need to um, uh, work against is, the, uh, is the, the tendency to lapse into one big thing, everything that has happened the, uh, in the Arab world without enough attention to national specificities. And it is, of course, true that there is a, an immense upsurge of democratic demand across the Arab world. That is one thing that is common among all of these movements. But then after that, you have national specificities. It begins in Tunisia, then immediately Egypt erupts. And in the Arab world, the centrality of Egypt being what it is, if it happens in Egypt, it becomes an all Arab phenomenon. The first thing that we noticed was that these were truly secular mo democratic movements, anti-authoritarian, with, an, with a s 
strong popular uh, current in it. Gradually, the Islamist movement uh, movements begin to emerge under the pressure of the mass of the mass movement. A year later, as the electoral field is opened up, we find the Islamist groups emerging in Tunisia, in Egypt, and so on. So can you give us a sort of a broad picture of this yeah. whole development? Well, there are two mistakes which should be avoided. The first one is the one that you indicated. Um, one should not speak of the Arab world, Lato Sensu, and, and, and generalize too quickly. Each country has its uh, uh, particular uh, uh, characteristics, of course. But even if there are common characteristics to the whole region, the second mistake that should be avoided is to come to a fast conclusion whether the Arab Spring, as it has been called, has been successful within one year or defeated. Right. It has been neither successful nor defeated. It's only the start of a wider movement. Uh, my first point would be to indicate that uh, the upsurge of people in Tunisia and e in Egypt particularly was not unexpected. It should have been expected, and it was expected, at least by a number of, of people on the left. Why is it so? Because the previous regimes during the Bandung period, the Arab countries, or a number of Arab countries, were on the forefront of the struggle for liberation and social change, and I would say progressive social change, even if not socialist. Um, the names of, uh, of, of uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser, the name of Boumedien, at least, are, are well known. But uh, these regimes, even if they were not democratic, were perfectly legitimate because, one, they achieved a lot from above, but they achieved land reform, they achieved uh, a move towards industrialization, they, uh, they achieved a gigantic jump ahead in uh, the fields of public services, basically education, health, and so on. And they achieved, through all that, uh, a kind of full employment, kind of, of course, and with guarantees to the working classes, to the popular classes, and an upward mobility from popular classes to, um, to um, middle classes. That gave them a perfect legitimacy. But once they got out of steam because of their internal limitations, uh, and, and that, that, uh, that was within 10, 15, or 20 years of achievements, of real achievements, and that coincided with uh, also the, the coming out of steam of historical, uh, really existing socialism, as one would say. Um, and when capital moved on the offensive under the umbrella of so-called neoliberalism and market uh, uh, and market economy, etc., etc., the ruling classes, in order to remain in office, in power, abandoned the national popular program and aligned on the uh, demands of neoliberalism uh, through uh, privatization, through dismantling of public services, through opening the economy, etc., etc. Now, this uh, neoliberal uh, recipe led to uh, uh, to, the, uh, to, to a social disaster within a few years. All which has been achieved throughout 20 years of national popular regimes were, were lost within a few years, coming back to growing and fast-growing inequality, uh, uh, mass uh, unemployment, precarity, uh, destruction of the uh, public services, particularly education and health, etc., etc. One, and then the uh, regimes, those regimes, lost their legitimacy and became more and more responsive to the popular resistance by uh, police, uh, by, by, by repression, uh, without anything else. They were fully supported by the US, by the Western imperialist power, in spite of the, there being more and more uh, police uh, regimes with no legitimacy. So, we were expecting the explosion at some point in time, and it came. It started in Tunisia, it moved quickly in Egypt. And we ought to, to see that 
at that point in time, um, the Western powers, particularly the US, were, as well as the regimes themselves, surprised uh, 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 by, by, by the, these, uh, the, the amplitude of this uh, uh, upsurge of the, of the people. And uh, <clears throat> uh, now we have to go perhaps a little more into some details. I mean, the movement, at least I will speak of Egypt in some details, the movement brought together a variety of components, the repoliticized youth, which is the new, uh, a new branch of the new proletariat with precarity, etc., etc., uh, the uh, new trade unions which have uh, emerged through the uh, enormous strikes which, which preceded the upsurge because they happened in Egypt in 2007 and 2008, the uh, uh, movement of, of resistance of small peasants to the exp accelerated expropriation uh, 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 produced by neoliberal uh, policies, etc., etc. All these movements are potentially, but I'm stressing potentially, left-oriented in the sense that they were expressing a double protest. Uh, a protest against uh, the, the, uh, the uh, social disaster, uh, but also a protest against uh, the uh, uh, police regime, the uh, ugliest form of, uh, of, of police regimes uh, for democratic demands. And at that point in time, also um, uh, organizations and movements within the middle classes, uh, uh, democratic-oriented, moved in. Now, but in the case of Egypt, at least, this uh, alliance, it's not yet an, an alliance, but this coming together of movements potentially, le potentially left-oriented. Why do I say potentially? Because while they were clear on their demands, they were not conscious of the link between the, the, the uh, social disaster and the police regime, the link, the objective link between that and so-called neoliberalism, which means really exi existing capitalism and imperialism as it is for us today. That link is not yet well established. It does exist among a minority of the radical left. It penetrates within the youth and within the, the new trade unions, but it is still uh, uh, at, at, at the very beginning. And therefore, facing uh, that um, potential alliance of progressive democratic forces, progressive, socially oriented, progressive, and potentially even, I would say, uh, potentially socialist in the longer, in the longer view, uh, run, uh, there is a block, a block organized of the reactionary forces, which brings together uh, a number also of components, but basically the high command of the army, because the support of the US to one billion and a half uh, uh, dollars a year was given to the Egyptian army, not in order to reinforce its uh, military capacity, but in order to destroy it by corrupting the high command and having the high command moving into and associating with the comprador bourgeoisie, uh, on the one hand, and the Muslim Brotherhood. Because while it is being repeated in the medias, that the Muslim Brotherhood were in the opposition to the regimes of Sadat and, 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 and Mubarak, this is a lie. The Muslim Brotherhood have been, were opposing Nasser's regime, Nasser's regime, but it is, uh, it is Sadat who brought them back immediately uh, when he turned to the right at the international level by aligning on the US and at the internal level by aligning on neoliberalism through the structural adjustment programs, etc., etc. Uh, they, were, they were allies. The, the proof of it is that the uh, Sadat and then Mubarak gave them, uh, <coughs> uh, sold out to, to their benefit, three major institutions of the society, education, and it was through education that the veil was reintroduced in the society, justice, and it is through justice that the Sharia was reintroduced, and the TV. Do you see a government giving to the opposition such major institutions? No, they were part. But 
there was a balance of power. The high command remained in, uh, in, uh, at, at, at the top of the, uh, in the commanding positions, and the Muslim Brotherhood were allies supporting them. Now, with the, at the beginning of the movement, as you know, and as everybody knows, the Muslim Brotherhood took position against the movement. They were expecting, as the U.S. establishment, as the government himself of Mubarak, the, uh, the defeat of the protest by mere repression. But uh, first day, one million people in this, on the streets, um, 300 people killed, nobody called the West and NATO to the rescue. Second day, two million people in the streets, uh, 300 people killed. Third day, three million people, 300 people killed. And uh, perhaps fifth or sixth day, 15 million people, which meant the change in the balance of force. And it is only at that point in time that the Muslim Brotherhood, the leadership, without even supporting still the movement, say, well, we don't mind our people joining the movement. They had already joined the movement, as everybody in the nation. Uh, then the, the strategy which was, which was uh, developed by the reactionary bloc under the leadership of uh, Obama himself, a short, a short transition, quiet, with fast elections, so-called free pluripartite election, and that's finished. It will establish a new legitimacy, the elected parliament. The movement uh, did not consider that that, that that should be the target. The movement asked for a longer transition in order to allow to the popular classes and the movement to organize itself, to conquer positions in society, and then perhaps we could have uh, meaningful elections. Anyway, we have had the elections. And as you mentioned, as well in Tunisia, and in Egypt, conditions in Tunisia are quite similar, with differences, but quite close to the case of Egypt. We had a victory of the Islamists, Muslim Brotherhood, 40% in uh, Tunisia and 60% or more in Egypt. Now, this victory of the Islamists, uh, uh, of the Muslim Brotherhood, was not unexpected. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and is, 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 is not curious. Uh, it was expected. Why? Because uh, the, uh, the um, uh, neoliberal recipe had led to what I'm calling a lumpen development in Egypt. That is a spiral going down uh, 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 with uh, survival activities uh, in the so-called informal sector, uh, developing fast, fast, fast and with the uh, significant productive activities being more and more reduced. Uh, this, was, uh, <clears throat> uh, this was the recipe of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism has nothing to offer but such a pattern of development. This pattern of so-called development, lumpen development, which in fact is pauperization, which means uh, 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 growing poverty, unemployment, precarity, etc., etc., for the majorities, the vast majorities, while a small minority becoming uh, billionaires uh, is benefiting from that pattern of, of so-called development, that led to, um, to the explosion. But the Muslim Brotherhood was uh, developing, uh, they, the, the, this pattern of spiral down is very favorable to them. Why? Because with the billion of dollars uh, offered, given to them by the Gulf, with the, with the benediction of, of Obama and of uh, the U.S. Uh, establishment, of course, were, were, folk, were, 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 were used precisely to finance the spiral down, to finance the poverty. Uh, that is when uh, a chap needs uh, some money to buy a taxi in order to survive, well, the Muslim brother could come and give him the money to buy the taxi. And when the uh, uh, um, the uh, public services and health are completely destroyed, well, the Muslim Brotherhood, thanks to the money of the Gulf, offer free, free uh, health, free care in centers of them. So uh, that this, uh, this chap would vote for those who support his uh, survival 
uh, would be a normal thing, which does not, does not mean that simultaneously he will not belong to a movement uh, claiming for re-establishing public services, re-establishing education, re-establishing uh, uh, normal rules for uh, labor conditions, etc., etc. There is this, uh, this duplication. And therefore, in the case of Egypt, you can see very clearly that as a result of the elections, there are two legitimacy. What I would call a minor legitimacy. Yes, the elected parliament has some legitimacy, but limited one, because the, the continuation of the struggle uh, for social justice, for democratization of the society, uh, etc., etc., has also its own legitimacy. And there is a conflict between the two. Additionally, the victory, the electoral victory of the Muslim Brotherhood have introduced a secondary contradiction, but still a contradiction, in the reactionary alliance between the high command of the army and the Muslim Brotherhood. Because now the Muslim Brotherhood are in a position to ask for a higher position within the alliance. No, not anymore being subordinated to the dictatorship of the high command. This, we don't know where it will lead. It can lead to clashes. It can lead to, there are continuous negotiations between them for compromises. We don't know where it will lead. So what I conclude on Egypt uh, by saying that, uh, in fact, we cannot say that the movement has been successful because nothing has been changes changed either at the level of the uh, power system which remains in the hands of the high command of the army and the Muslim Brotherhood nor at the level of changes in the social organization but uh, also we cannot say that it has been defeated because the movement is still going on and uh, I, I read this history as the beginning of a long wave I don't know of how, how many years it will continue with ups and downs, with possibly victories, but also, also possibly defeats, but it will continue as a movement. Because the main thing positive which has changed is that the people are no more afraid. Fear has disappeared. By, by, by have getting some results, even if tiny results, by moving into the streets in millions, and not being afraid of repression, of, uh, of the police with guns and tanks against them, now the fear has disappeared. And this is a change which will have effects in the longer run. Samir, thank you very, very much for this very enlightening uh, commentary, uh, condensed version of what has happened over the last one year. I'll be asking you some more questions for the second part of our interview. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.